Hey everyone, welcome back. On this IXO video, we're covering volume again. However, this time we are covering the volume of cones. And that is IXL assignment T11, volume of cones, shortcut YYR. I am creating this video on PowerPoint again instead of IXL, and the reason for that is I want to make sure that you guys have a, an example of each type of problem. And if I just hop onto IXL, it randomizes it, and I can't guarantee that. But I really want to make sure you guys can see every different version. So the first two examples are finding volume. And the second two are ones where we're given volume, but we either have to find the radius or the height. So these are a little bit more advanced. So depending on what you're here for, you can either watch the whole video or you kind of can kind of skip halfway through. All right, but let's go ahead and get started. Our very first question here is a cone has a height of 20 centimeters and a radius of seven centimeters. What is the volume? Use the pi approximation of three and 14 hundredths and round your answer to the nearest hundredth. All right, excellent. Tucked away up here in the corner, I have put a copy of the, vol the formula for the volume of a cone. Now this doesn't actually show up on IXL, so please make sure you jot that down on some paper so you can have that for reference. If you were to Google this formula or find it on a reference sheet, the way that you see it written about 90% of the time would be the volume is equal to one third times pi times r squared times h. And that is correct. But if you listen to me and saw, I wrote mine a little different. And the reason is because if you multiply something by one third, that is the same as dividing it by three. My brain sees the fraction and kind of freaks out. But when I look at this, I just see division and that doesn't bother me as much, which is why I like to look at the formula this way. They're the same thing, all right? It's like one of them has a jacket and one doesn't. It's the same outfit, same person. Kind of that example didn't really work, but whatever. But they're synonyms, they're really the same, okay? Because if you multiply something by one third, that's the same as dividing it by three. This is just the version that works better for my brain so that's what I like to use. And if you don't like to use that, that's okay. You can multiply by a third. There's nothing wrong with that. All right. So now let's go ahead and get into this. We've read the problem. We've identified our formula. So our next step is to identify all of our important information. And we are going to color code it so it matches the formula. The first piece of information I'm given is the height, which is green. So the height of this cone is 20 centimeters. And I'm also told that the radius is seven centimeters. We are being asked to find the volume. And for this entire IXL assignment, we are using 3.14, or to say that properly, three and 14 hundredths for pi. Once we've identified the information, the next step is to substitute. So plug our values in for our variables. So we're gonna follow the formula as is. V equals, I don't know the volume, so that stays the, the variable V, and that's equal to pi, but we're using three and 14 hundredths. And I see that it's written right next to the R. When you have those written side by side, that's the lazy mathematician way to show multiplication. But now that we have numbers, we can't do that because then it'll look like one big number. So we gotta use a multiplication symbol. Either use parentheses, which is what I'm gonna use, or you can use a dot. There are no X's because that's a variable. So multiply by seven squared, and then multiply by our height, which is 20. And all of that is divided by three. Once we have substituted, our next step is we need to solve. And we're gonna solve this by following the order of operations. So PIMDAS, or as I like to say, GIMDAS, because the P makes you think only parentheses, but really it's any type of grouping symbol. So parentheses, brackets, fraction bars, any grouping symbol. 
When we follow that, we notice we do have something in a grouping symbol, this seven squared. All right, we have an operation within parentheses, which makes it a grouping symbol parentheses. So what is seven squared? Well, seven squared means seven times seven, and that's 49. I'm struggling to switch back here, my bad guys, so we'll keep going across. That means we now have three and 14 hundredths multiplied by 49 multiplied by 20, all divided by 3. Next is, well, remember how I called it GIMDAS because the G for grouping symbols? Well, one grouping symbol is actually a fraction bar. And if we look at our numerator, we don't just have one solid number. We got a whole bunch of things being multiplied. That needs to be simplified. So our next step is to multiply the entire numerator. And the beauty is, when it's straight up multiplication, you can multiply in any order, and you can also put that entire thing into your calculator at once. So over here, I just went to desmos.com and pulled up a free calculator, um, but you can use whatever calculator you wish. So three and 14 hundredths multiplied by 49 multiplied by 20. And whoo, that's a big number. So 3,000. 77 and 2 tenths. So we're going to come down over here where we have room. So 3,077 and 2 tenths. And all of that is divided by 3. So we're ready for our final set of operation, and that is to divide by 3. If you're using the Desmos Scientific Calculator, it took me a minute to figure this out. But this little button right here, A and S, stands for answer. So if you click that, it takes the answer from up above, and we can divide that by three. Saves us a little time, a little typing. Ooh, look at that bad boy. That is not already rounded for us, which means we're going to have to do some rounding, aren't we? All right. So this is our volume. But if we look back at our original directions, it tells us to round to the nearest hundredth. So I know this was a question that I've gotten a couple emails on. So let's discuss how to round this to the nearest hundredth. When you're rounding to the nearest hundredth, that means we are rounding to two decimal places. Because nearest hundredth, when you talk about decimal places, you go tenths, hundredths, thousandths, and then so on. So if we're rounding to the nearest hundredth, we want two decimal places. That means we need to look at the third number, all right? So I'm going to stop writing this after the third decimal point because that third number will tell us whether we round up or down, all right? Because our final answer should only have two numbers. So we look at that third one to identify our rounding. If that third number in the thousandths place is a five or greater, we round up. So this, let me turn my highlighter on. So this three would then round up to a four. But if this third number is a four or lower, we round down. So basically everything gets truncated, it gets stopped, and this would just stay a three. That is the case for this problem. Because our third number, so the number in the thousands place, is less than five, we're going to round down. So we truncate, we stop that, and our final answer rounded to the nearest hundredth is simply 1,025 and 73 hundredths. And that would be a correct answer on IXL. All right, let's try another one. Maybe. There we go. All right, sometimes instead of words, you will get a diagram or a picture. The trick is with this is you have to be able to look at those numbers and know which number is your height and which number is your radius. All right. So what you think and which is which? Well, if we think about the word height, that's how tall something is. So if we look at our diagram, our picture here that's labeled, which one of these labels is showing the height, showing how tall it is? Yeah, this one right here, that goes from the top of the cone all the way to the bottom, which means our 
cone has a height of eight inches. The second piece of information we need is the radius. Well, we think back to sixth grade when we learned about radius, that was part of our circles unit because that's what radius is related to is anything that has a circle, all right? Let's see if I can circle this in pink. So right here, the very bottom of our cone is a circle, which means whatever part that's labeled that's part of your circle is going to be our radius. But what do you notice about this? Yeah, it goes all the way across. It goes from edge to edge. So if it goes from edge to edge, is that really the radius? Yeah, no, they've given us the diameter. The whole thing is the diameter. And then half of it, so from the center to the edge, that part only is the radius. So your radius is half of the diameter. If the whole thing is eight, what's half of eight? So eight divided by two. Yeah, four, which means we have a radius of four. So sometimes you'll have to do a little bit of extra work because they don't always straight up give you the radius. Sometimes you gotta find it. But once you've identified your important information, we're still using three and 14 hundredths for pi. We substitute and solve just like before. So I just covered really the only difference between example one and example two. So now you'll get a duplicate. So if you're still a little confused, hopefully this will register. All right, we look up in the corner, we got our formula for the volume of a cone. V is equal to pi, and we're using three and 14 hundredths, multiplied by our radius squared, four squared, multiplied by our height of eight. And all of that is divided by three. Once again, our first step is to deal with our exponents. So what is four squared? Well, I'm writing, my question to you is four squared, is the answer eight or is the answer 16? The answer is 16 because four squared is four times itself twice. So four times four, which is 16. Any ideas? what mistake would have been made to have gotten the answer eight instead? Just an error analysis. Uh -huh. They would, if you would have accidentally put eight as your answer, you would have been taking four times two, which is wrong. It's not four times two, it's four times itself twice. So four times four. So it's an easy mistake to make. So make sure you're always watching yourself to get that right. All right, next step was we got to simplify that numerator. We got to multiply all the way across. So let me clear my calculator here. We're going to multiply 3 and 14 hundredths times 16 times 8. Ooh, that's a little bit smaller of a number than last time. That's kind of nice. And that is equal to 401 and 92 hundredths all divided by three. Our final step is to once again divide. Ooh, and we got around again, we got around again. So we have 133. Now, my directions for this entire IXL assignment do say round to the nearest hundredth. So remember the nearest hundredth is the second decimal place. So if we're rounding to the second decimal place, we got to look at one number after that. So one number after that is what we need to look at. So 973. And that third number is what tells us whether we round up or round down. I got three again, and three is less than five, which means we will round down. And our final answer becomes 133 and 97 hundredths. All right, now 
once you, when you're working on this assignment, once you get up into the 50s or 60s, you will possibly get a more challenging one. And that's what my next two questions are over. And so if you guys think that you got it, I love it. You can do all of those. I hope you can. But please stick around so you can watch these next two. Because once you get into the 50s or 60s, you have a probable chance of one of these upcoming questions popping up. All right. Let's read this and see if we can find out what's different. The volume of this cone, huh? The volume of the cone. It's giving us the volume. That's weird. Oh, that's a big number. 2,279 and 64 hundredths. Whew, good thing we have a calculator, right? So yes, you may see a yikes big number, but you got a calculator, so it's okay. And we want to find this time the height of the cone. Okay. All right, even though this is a little bit different, my steps are very similar. My first step is still to identify the information we're given. Just this time, the information I'm given includes the volume. And then if we look at our diagram here, did they give us the radius or the diameter? Yeah, they gave us the radius because if we look at the marking, it's from the center to the edge. It doesn't go all the way across. So that, in fact, is the radius. What are we being asked to find this time? We want to know the height. That's what we're trying to find, which means our h will stay a variable. That is our unknown piece. All right, second step is just like before. We're still going to substitute. Just now, we're going to have to substitute in for v. So our volume is 2,279 and 64 hundredths. And that is equal to pi times our radius squared, which is 11 squared, times our height. And that is unknown, so it remains a variable. And everything is divided by 3. All right. The next step is the same. We got to get rid of that exponent, OK? So we got a little bit more writing here. Hopefully, I won't run out of room. Fingers and toes are crossed. What is 11 squared? And if you're not sure, that would be something to work on. Having your perfect squares, which is what these are, memorized from 1 to 12 is a good thing. And if you don't know, use the calculator until you get it memorized. But 11 squared is 11 times 11, and that is 121. Next step is still the same. I need to multiply. Just in this case, I'm not multiplying three numbers. I'm only multiplying two because my h is still a variable. All right, let's clear this. Oops, that's not what I wanted. All right, so three and fourteen hundredths times 121. So 2,279 and 64, which is equal to 379 and 94 hundredths times h, all divided by 3. All right, this is the point in time where the steps are a little bit different. So up until this point, yes, our numbers were larger. We had a little bit more writing, but everything matched examples 1 and 2. At this point, we have simplified this. We are trying to get h by itself. Last week, I saw some students taking the 379 and 94 hundredths and dividing it by 3. That is really going to mess up your decimal places. And that is not proper. OK? So what we actually need to do is we need to get rid of our fraction. That fraction, remember, is division. We're now in solving an equation mode. What is the inverse, so the opposite of division? 
multiplication. So to get rid of that dividing by three, we're gonna multiply both sides by three. Over here, when we multiply both sides by three, they cancel out because they're opposites, they're inverses. Now, I'm gonna use my calculator again. And we have, let's go into a new line. So three times 2,279 and 64 hundredths. which is equal to 6,838 and 92 hundredths. Yes, I know these numbers are big, but please don't let it scare you because you do have that calculator. You just have a little bit more writing to do. Your hand might cramp up a bit. All right. Whew, take a deep breath. We got one more step, uno mas. We'll have just enough room. What do we wanna do if we wanna get H by itself? Yeah, now we need to divide both sides by that 3,000, 3,000, sorry, 379 and 94 hundredths. Because division is the inverse of multiplication and it currently was being multiplied by the height. Thankfully here I can hit enter and use that answer from above, save myself a little bit of time in typing. 379 and 94 hundredths. Oh yay, a nice pretty answer. I love it when that happens. So the height of our cone is 18 millimeters. Yay, and that's our answer. All right, we have one more example and it is similar to this one. So if you kind of got a little bit lost in the steps, we got one more here. And then of course you could always go back and rewatch. All right, the volume of this cone is 640, ooh, a smaller number, and 56 hundredths cubic inches. What is the radius of this cone? Ah, so what are we trying to find this time? Yeah, not the height, the radius. But again, very similar process to what we did before. So let's check this one out. We want to label our information. That's always number one. We are told the volume is 640 and 56 hundredths. We are being asked to find the radius. That's our question mark. And if we look at our diagram, they labeled, oh, sorry, my dog's whining, a height of 17. All right, information's been labeled. Let's substitute it on in. So our V is our volume, which is 640 and 56 cubic inches. That is equal to pi. Now we don't know our radius, so that's going to stay a variable, but we do know our height is 17. And all of that's divided by 3. All right, in all the other problems we've done, we've started with our exponent, but can we start with our exponent this time? Yeah, no, because our exponent is our variable. Here you go, Rome's gonna make an appearance. She's not feeling it today. Yeah. Because that's our variable. So we can't do r squared because we don't know r. All right, that means we gotta skip that step. But here's the beautiful thing about multiplication. Do you remember how earlier I said when you have all three things that are being multiplied? So we have three and 14 hundredths times our r squared times our 19. You can multiply in any order which means even though the three and 14 hundredths and the 17 aren't side by side, I can multiply them together because it is straight up multiplication all the way across. That in fact becomes our very first step. So three and 14 hundredths times 17. 
we have 640 and 56 hundredths, and that is equal to 53 and 38 hundredths times r squared, all divided by three. All right, once you've done that, hopefully, so think back to what we did on that last one, what comes next? we got to get rid of that fraction. So that fraction is thought of as division. We have an equation here. We're going to the other side. What's the inverse of division? Multiplication. So we're going to multiply both sides by 3. So 3 times 640 and 56 hundredths. becomes 1,921 and 68 hundredths. And over here, these are inverses, which means they cancel each other out. And we're left with 53 and 38 hundredths multiplied by R squared. All right, we want to get that R by itself. We got to get that variable alone. And it's currently being multiplied by 53 and 38 hundredths. So the inverse of multiplication is division. We will divide both sides. Oops, I am getting super sloppy. Sorry, guys. All right, so divide that by 53 and 38 hundredths. Ooh, we get 36. Oh, I love it when we get nice even numbers. That makes my heart so happy. So 36 is equal to R squared. All right, this part is a little new because we have R squared. I don't want to know R squared. I want to know R. But we need to think about what the inverse is, because up here, the inverse of division was multiplication. Down here, the inverse of multiplication was division. So what's the inverse of a square? And not like the shape of square, so the answer is not a circle. The square as in has an exponent of 2. What is the inverse? What is the opposite of squaring something? Taking the square root. And if you look at the calendar right here, I'm going to take my little laser pointer, this button right here, it kind of looks like a division bar, but it's not. That is a square root button. So we are going to take the square root of both sides because the square root cancels out the exponent of a 2, and that allows us to simply find what R is. Now, we're going to be getting deeper into square roots in our upcoming unit. So after we finish unit four on transformations and we get into unit five, we're going to be talking more about square roots. But it is important that you have your one through twelves memorized. Okay, so this is kind of a good time for you to get a little heads up. If you don't know what the square root of 36 is, you can find it out on your calculator, but it will be something that you need to memorize because they will ask you those kind of questions on a non-calculator portion of the FSA. But the square root of 36 is basically what times what equals 36, and it needs to be the same number times itself. And if you were to put that in your calculator, you can just type it in as such and it gives you the answer, 6, which makes sense because 6 times 6 is 36. So all your doubles is what I mean by all of your perfect squares. All right, we have a radius of six. So this one's done, yay. All right, as always guys, if you have any questions, either send me an email and make sure you specify you have a question on this assignment, or of course come to my help session, which the help sessions are now on Fridays. But whenever I am available, I will be doing other help sessions. It's just it may not be on a strict schedule. So if you ever see extra ones on your Class Connect schedule and you're able to join, then awesome. You can join and get some extra help. All right. Thank you guys for being awesome. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.